Well, good morning and welcome to another teaching. It's a Friday morning here in Texas. Hopefully y'all are doing well and just loving on Jesus and uh, spending time with Jesus, um, spending time in the scriptures and the living word of God, feeding your, your spirit and your soul, um, just spending time in prayer and in thanksgiving, um, in worship. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So again, there's really, there's nothing in our lives that's of greater value than living for Jesus, loving for Jesus, giving for Jesus, and forgiving for Jesus. Right, Melanie? So thank you, Lord Jesus. So today we're going to continue in John 3. Last time we got through uh, verse 8. So today um, we're going to do verses 9 to 15. Um, just uh, again, we're, it's, we're still in the conversation that Jesus is having with Nicodemus, who was a, uh, a, a ruler um, in the religious hierarchy, uh, a Pharisee. Um, he was on the, uh, uh, the Jewish ruling council, right, it says. Um, it says he was a member of that ruling council, and so he was educated. Um, not only he was tremendously educated in the, in the old Testament, right. Um, but he was also would have been educated in a, in a worldly sense. So, um, and Nicodemus is having a, a conversation with him here. Now he comes to Jesus, it says at night, um, in, uh, in verse two, it says he came to Jesus at night. So we're not told why it was at night. But the probability is it was because he didn't want to be seen publicly, but he still came to Jesus, right? And we've said there's nothing more important. Those, uh, those first four words of verse two, he came to Jesus, are the single most important words of our life to become a Christian and then as Christians, right? We want to continue to come to Jesus, continue to spend our lives growing to know Jesus, growing to know his love growing in our growing in intimacy with him, right? Uh, growing to hear his voice, right, Peyton? Um, so thank you, Lord Jesus. So we're going to go ahead and pray and then we'll read verses 9 to 15 and we will get rolling. Well, Father, we thank you for the living word of God. We thank you for your mercy and your favor and your goodness on our lives. Father, above all, we thank you for Jesus our only Lord and Savior and Master and King and God. Holy Spirit, we ask you to lead us and guide us now as we open the scriptures. Give us eyes that see and ears that hear. Lord Jesus, we love you and we praise you and we thank you and we commit this time into your hands. In Jesus' name, in your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Okay, John 3, verses 9 to 15. <clears throat> I'm going to start in verse 8. Actually, I'll start in verse seven. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. This is Jesus speaking. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. Verse nine. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. Verse 10. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? I tell you the truth, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Okay, so last time we went through verse 8, but... Verse seven is an important verse because it's tied to verse nine. Jesus has explained to Nicodemus twice that the necessity of him having a spiritual rebirth. In verse three, 
He tells him he needs to be born again or he won't be able to see or understand anything that has to do with the kingdom of God or heaven or, you know, or the, 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 the deep spiritual realities of our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That unless he's born again, he can have no understanding or insight into who God really is or anything to understand about heaven. Then he doubles down Jesus in verse five and says, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and spirit. So not only can you not know anything about the triune God, but you cannot go to heaven or enter the kingdom of God um, without this spiritual rebirth. So Nicodemus is, is kind of, you know, he, he cannot he cannot grasp this. It is a it is a massive deal for him to hear this because what Jesus is clearly explaining to him is that where he is presently is not sufficient. Okay, he has an incomplete understanding of who God is, and he needs a spiritual rebirth. He needs spiritual life. Right. He needs heavenly life to come into him. He needs regeneration of his spirit. Otherwise, he, he will not go to heaven, nor will he ever be able to understand anything that has to do with the kingdom of God or heaven. And this is a, uh, uh, I mean, we cannot imagine how radical this would have been for Nicodemus. Nicodemus would have spent his life studying the scriptures. He would have known the scriptures better than probably any Christian alive today. And the scriptures did testify about the Lord coming and, and, and giving us new life and changing our, our hard hearts of stone, right? And the Lord coming to live in us and to be with us, right? And to be one with us as our God. Um, and, and Jesus tells Nicodemus in verse 7, after he's told him twice, you should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. That's a very heavy statement because Jesus tells Nicodemus, you should not be surprised. Now, to most of us that, you know, no one has ever heard this before, right? Jesus comes on the scene and no one has ever heard this said in these words, right? That, that you have to have a spiritual rebirth. You have to be born again spiritually, if you are going to understand anything at all that has to do with the kingdom of God, the word of God, and, and really to understand redemption and what it means to have your sins forgiven and to, to, to have relationship with the triune God, you cannot understand or see any of that unless you have a spiritual rebirth. And so it's, it, it's an overwhelming thing, again, because Nicodemus believed that he already had this transformation, this, this new inner life. He believed he had everything he needed, right? And yet he's being told that he clearly does not have it. Where are you today? Do you have spiritual life as you listen to this, right? Are you alive spiritually, right? Do you have not only, obviously, if you're listening to this or watching it, you have physical life, but do you have a vibrant, pulsating, spiritual, Christ-filled life living inside of you, okay? Do you have a drive that you wanna know Jesus and walk with Jesus and spend time with Jesus and worship Jesus and love on Jesus and help others to get to know Jesus? Do you have spiritual life living in you, okay? Because just like Nicodemus, none of us can enter the kingdom of God. We cannot go to heaven. We cannot understand anything about heaven. We cannot have relationship with the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit, unless we have this spiritual life living in us, okay? Now again, how do you get this? If you, you get it by receiving Jesus, as your Lord and Savior. When you believe the word of God, that you are a sinful human being and dead in your sin, spiritually dead in your sin, 
You believe that you're hopeless and helpless, but you believe that there is a solution and that the only solution is to receive the Savior, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who God has given his word in the Bible, came and lived a perfect life for you, died a perfect death for you, and is alive and risen. And that by receiving him and trusting him and relying on him and him alone as your only Lord and Savior, by doing that, all your sins will be forgiven. And the very life of Jesus, Jesus himself, in the form of his spirit, the Holy Spirit, will come and enter into you and join himself to your spirit. And when he does that, boom, you come into spiritual life, right? You are actually born again spiritually. You go from being dead in your sin to alive, spiritually alive, in and through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The very spirit of Jesus comes to live in you. And when the spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, becomes one with your dead spirit, boom, an explosion of life comes and he gives life and, and a miraculous rebirth, right? You are born again spiritually and it's like the lights get turned on, right? In this studio, there are lights here, a big one, a light here, a light there. And it's like the lights are turned on and now you begin to experience relationship with God the Father as your heavenly Father and Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and Master and King. And you begin to experience relationship with the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, who's your counselor and your comforter, right? Um, and it's uh, you begin to desire to spend time with Jesus, right? Um, you begin to want to study the word of God and the whole thing just becomes more exciting. So if you haven't given your life to Jesus today, Romans 10, 13 promises. God has given his word that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, again, it's important to understand it's not the words that save us, okay? It's Christ Jesus that saves us, right? But the words are the vehicle we use, right? To call out to him, right? To explain to Jesus, Jesus, I, I confess I'm a sinful man. I know that I cannot save myself. But Jesus, I believe that you lived for me and you died on the cross for me. And I believe that you're alive and risen. And therefore, Lord Jesus, I humbly but desperately call on you and ask you to come into my heart and to be the Lord of my life and to save me from my sin, to bring me to heaven when I die. Jesus, I place all my faith and trust and reliance and hope in you alone to save me and to be my everlasting Lord and God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. That's how you call out to the Lord, right? But you do it in your, in your understanding that you are hopeless and desperate without him, totally helpless, nothing you can do. And out of that, you run to Jesus, knowing he's the only solution for the forgiveness of your sins, the salvation of your soul and this new spiritual life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Wow. Okay. Um, you should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. So oftentimes, so when Jesus says this, he means it to Nicodemus. He said, this should not be a surprise to you. Uh, it spoke about it in your Bible. How often, you know, are we as believers just surprised about some things or surprised about some teachings, right? When we have it in our Bible all along, and we're going to talk about that. If we spent time in our Bible and we spent more time in our Bible and time pursuing our relationship with Jesus, right, May? Um, then we wouldn't be so surprised about certain things, right? Still, I mean, Philippians 1.29 says that, you know, it's been granted to us not only to believe on Christ, but to suffer for him. And sometimes we, you know, uh, myself included, I I'm chief here, just I'm surprised and frustrated and irritable when I'm going through suffering. And yet the Bible says that we would, as Christians, go through suffering. Um, so, if we spent more time pursuing our relationship with Jesus, 
spending time in the scriptures and growing to know him, then we wouldn't be surprised and Nicodemus shouldn't be surprised, right? Jesus goes on and we already explained verse eight, so we won't talk about it. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. He tells Nicodemus, you're not going to understand everything about this spiritual rebirth. You're not going to understand. There are, there are mysterious heavenly workings of the spirit of God that you're not going to be able to understand. But yet the new birth does happen in this life, right? It, 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 it has tremendous heavenly origins, but it happens in this life, right? It happens on this earth. And it says it in the physical Bible that we have, right? Um, but just like the wind where you don't know where it starts, where it's going, where it's ending, what's up with it. Uh, it's the same with the Holy Spirit of God, right? You're never going to going to completely understand God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit, right? They do as they will, right? And how it all works, as Nicodemus cannot understand this, you're never going to understand it fully. We are going to have to receive him by faith, right? Um, and so it's interesting, after Jesus says to Nicodemus, you should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. Nicodemus replies, verse nine, how can this be? Nicodemus asked. Okay, so Jesus just told him you shouldn't be surprised. And yet he's overwhelmingly surprised. So when Jesus just told him you shouldn't be surprised, that went poof, right over Nicodemus's head. And again, it's almost understandable because again, he's being told by Jesus that he does not have the inner life that he needs to go to heaven and to understand the, the, the word of God and the kingdom of God and the triune God. How can this be, Nicodemus asked? Those are the six words of verse nine. How can this be, Nicodemus asked? Look at Jesus' reply to this. Verse 10. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? It's a pretty heavy verse. Okay, verse ten is a uh, it's it's a sharp, clear rebuke from Jesus to Nicodemus. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? We talked about how Nicodemus was a uh, was 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 a ruler, was a Pharisee was was educated in every manner, would have known the scriptures, and would have been one of the highest level teachers in all of Israel, teaching about the word of God, right? There would have been maybe no one that had more insight or understanding. There would have been no one more qualified, quote unquote, at that time that the people went to at the temple to teach, right? You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And do you not understand these things? What he's saying is, you're the one that's responsible for teaching the nation of Israel about the kingdom of God, the word of God, the scriptures, the son of God. You're the one responsible to teach all of Israel the truths of the scriptures, the revelation of the scriptures, right? And yet you don't understand this? So if Nicodemus is the teacher and he doesn't understand it, then where is all Israel left? So it's a it's it's a clear rebuke to Nicodemus. And it's a rebuke in the rebuke Jesus is clearly implying that Nicodemus should have been able to understand these things at some level. And Jesus has just explained it to him now. He told him you shouldn't be surprised. Nicodemus has had it in his Bible in the Old Testament, right? But yet he's just, he's so taken back with what Jesus is saying. He says, how, how can this be? How can, how, can, how can I not have all that I need 
in my walk with God, in my relationship with God. And Jesus has clearly told him that you do not. Um, and this this is a this is a uh, a clear exhortation, or we could even say rebuke to those of us who are teachers in the body of Christ today, in the church today, right? As surely as he's saying, you are Israel's teacher, he's saying to those of us who are pastors and teachers and and elders and deacons, right? He's saying to us, you guys are the teachers of the church and you don't understand the word of God. You don't understand the deep truths of the scriptures. So there's a, there's a, a, a clear exhortation. This is a reprimand to Nicodemus that as teachers, right? It's, it's extremely important that we, we, we understand the scriptures. We don't teach ourselves. We teach the word of God. Okay. A kingdom discipleship. All we do is teach the scriptures, right? The vast majority of the time we teach them verse by verse, by verse, by verse. We have taught through John three. I'm sorry. We, all the way up through John 3. We taught through John 1. We taught through John 2. Now we're halfway through John 3 here, and we're teaching verse by verse by verse. And it's a tremendous responsibility as a teacher to teach the Word of God, because the people who are not teachers are learning from what we're teaching. That's why we don't teach ourselves, but we teach the Scriptures. And... Uh, um, our IT guy, Stephen, has uh, would actually did a, a little bit of study, and I was pleased because he brought up the fact that James 3 says not many of us should be teachers, right? Because as teachers, we're judged more strictly, right? And that's a scary thing. So again, as teachers, we want to teach the scriptures. We want to teach about Jesus properly. And again, we don't teach ourselves. We don't teach our own ideas. We don't teach our own feelings, right? We only teach the living word of God, the Bible. The 66 books of the Bible is all that we've been given to teach. All right. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And so, um, and again, the, the implication is that Nicodemus should have understood these things as the teachers. So again, um, as Christians, we have the scriptures and we want to give ourselves to the scriptures. Okay. And the more we do this, the more we give ourselves to script to the scriptures and give ourselves to walking with Jesus, growing in relationship with Jesus, right? Um, the more that we will know the insights of the word of God and the deeper our relationship with Jesus will become, right? You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? Verse 11, I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know and what we, I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. And this is a heavy verse. When he says, we speak of what we know. It could be probably three different things he's saying. We're not certain what he means. What does he mean by we? It would have been easier if he said, I tell you the truth, I speak about what I know. And he does say these things like this in other places, right? Um, and certainly he does know. So he says we, right? So you see he's including others. So when he says, I tell you the truth, we speak of what we know, well, the first and the potential most obvious thing could be that he's speaking about him and the Father or him, the Father, and the Spirit, okay? We speak of what we know, okay? So that it is certainly true that the Father, the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, anything Jesus spoke, they all knew and it's all correct, okay? So when he, who's he talking about when he says we? He could be talking about him and the Father, or he could be talking about him, the Father, and the Holy Spirit, okay? Now, he could also be saying, I tell you the truth, we speak of what we know. He could have been speaking about him and John the Baptist, right? We talked about John the Baptist all through chapter one, and John the Baptist was sent by God the Father to go ahead of Jesus and to proclaim that the Messiah was coming. And so Jesus could be talking about that, you know, John and I speak of what we know from the Father, Right. Or even possibly Jesus could be speaking about that, you know, me and my disciples speak of what we know, meaning, 
Jesus has instructed his disciples and his disciples have believed it. And now they're speaking about it because they know it to be true and they believe it as well because they learned it from Jesus. So again, we're not told exactly who the we are here, but those are three possibilities. I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know. Okay. When Jesus Christ speaks, it is absolutely certain. Okay. If you could be more certain, mathematical equations are certain, right? When scientists study the universe, they do it by math. Okay. Everything is done by math. Even all science is dependent on the math behind it at some level. It's, it's an incredible thing when you study it. And I'm not a scientist, but, but the math is the truest thing that everyone believes. Okay. The, the mathematics are what everyone believes, okay? As far as scientists, right? And the and the and the and the and the smartest minds and the physicists, they believe the math behind everything, okay? Um, but as certain as two and two is four, just to use the 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 plainest and easiest example, that is a mathematical fact. Two plus two is four, okay? There's no debating it, okay? Um, 100 plus 100 is 200, right? And then there are countless millions, billions of mathematical equations, trillions, right? Um, and when the equation is done correctly, it is correct. As certain as two and two is four, when Jesus speaks, it is absolute truth. It's more true than two and two is four, okay? Now, you really can't get to more true because it is true. And what Jesus speaks is, is absolutely as true and to whatever extent it would be more true if Jesus says it. I tell you the truth, we speak of what we know. When the Bible speaks, when you've got the words in red in your Bible, it's absolute. As a matter of fact, when you have all the words in the 66 books of your Bible, it's absolutely true. Okay, The greatest truth we have in our lives are the words that are in our Bible. I tell you the truth, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. And that is our job, by the way, as disciples of Jesus, is to speak the truth that we, that we know, Esther, and then to testify to what we have seen, right? Testify to the, to the work of Jesus Christ in our lives and in the lives of others. Testify to the truth of the Word of God. Do you have a lifestyle? Scott, of speaking about Jesus and testifying to what Jesus has done? Do you testify, Jose, to what Jesus has done? Now, as it's happened here, for those of us who do testify and speak about Jesus, he says, I tell you the truth, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still, you people do not accept our testimony. It's our job to speak the truth of the word of God and of the son of God, Chloe. But there will be people, regrettably, that still do not accept our testimony, but we want to continue to testify, continue to testify to what Jesus has done in our lives, right? Revelation 12, 11 says they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. We, we overcome everything by Jesus first, by the blood of the lamb, but then testifying to what Jesus has done in our life and how he's done it. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Verse 12. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? What are the earthly things Jesus is speaking about? I have spoken to you of earthly things. It, it's, it's amazing that the deep truth that Jesus has just spoken about are actually things on earth that Nicodemus should have been able to understand and should have believed, right? Because the new birth, although it has its origins in heaven, happens on earth. The, the, the spiritual life happens in this life. And it's in our Bible, right? It was in the Old Testament, and here it is plainly in John 3, right? So when, when, when we teach it here, right, for those listening to this, when you have heard me speaking about the new birth and taking it right out of the scriptures in John 3 here, we have this physical Bible, okay? 
you have a Bible on earth in your life that actually is a physical book on earth, right? And it's the living word of God. Now it's a heavenly word, but we have it on earth and we're given to it so that we can understand it on earth and live it on earth. And if we won't and cannot believe or walk in the things that have that we have on this earth to help us to walk with Jesus and, and know Jesus, how will we ever understand uh, bigger mysteries or heavenly mysteries? There are there are many a Christian that has spent their life trying to pursue these deep, mysterious, heavenly uh, mysteries, but yet they don't spend time in what they do have in the living word of God. They have a physical Bible with the living word of God, right? If you will not give yourself to the tools that the Lord has given you, then don't expect that he's going to give you anything beyond that. In order for us to know deeper mysteries, okay, things of heaven even, right, or things that go beyond things like this incredible new spiritual birth, we're going to have to accept the things that, that have a tangible representation on earth, right? The new birth is something that happens in this life, right? That spiritual rebirth is something that you and I need in this life. And we already talked about how to receive that, right? Our Bible is the living word of God. And we've been given it. It's been given to us in this life to feed us and to teach us and to, and to lead us, right? It has, it has all the purposes in this life to help us to know Jesus and to walk with him. It's in the scriptures that we can be saved. If you, if you turn over to, what is it? Second Timothy three, 15 and 16, it says, right, that um, verse 15, and how from, in, I'm sorry, yes, verse 15, 2 Timothy 3, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures. So he's talking to Timothy, and Paul says that how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The first thing your Bible does is it gives you wisdom and makes you wise for salvation, right? It makes you wise of how to know Jesus as your savior, of how to be forgiven of your sins, right? That's the first priority of scripture is that to lead you to faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, the salvation of your soul, and the new spiritual life that you get when you're born again, when you receive Christ, right? Verse 16, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Okay, so you see, we have these scriptures. We have this living word of God. And if we want to know Anything deeper, we're going to have to give ourselves daily, substantially to reading the scriptures, studying the scriptures, meditating on the scriptures and obeying the scriptures and repenting where we fall short. OK, and in as much as we'll give ourselves to the things we do have, right, the things he's given us on this earth to know him more. It's only then that he can reveal himself to us in the deeper mysteries or the, the deeper ways. Does that make sense? So, but he says to Nicodemus, I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you speak? How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? It's a, uh, you know, it's, it's just a hard, it's, it's, it's such a hard thing for Nicodemus to do because in the time of Jesus and even after Jesus's ascension, Paul speaks about how still um, there's this veil that covers, you know, people's eyes, right? It's a veil that covers their, their mind that they cannot seemingly understand the things of God. And it's only that when you give your life to Christ, that that veil is removed, 
right? That that veil where you cannot understand, where you, you know, there was a veil over their eyes that they cannot, you know, they cannot understand God. They cannot see God. They, they none, of, none of this really makes sense to them. And then Paul says it, and actually we can turn there in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and we'll, we'll read in verse 14. Um, he says here, 2 Corinthians 3, 14, but their minds were made dull. For to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, verse 15, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Okay? So, have you, do you understand these things? Is this teaching making sense to you? Right? Because for someone that doesn't know Christ, right? When you're not a Christian, most of the time you, you don't have a whole lot of interest in God. Or if you're not a Christian and you do have interest in God, you, you have religion, right? Where, where biblical Christianity is about having a, a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, a growing and intimate relationship with God our Father and God the Son Jesus and the Holy Spirit. But in order to have that, that veil has to be removed and that's removed when, when you receive Christ into your heart, as we talked about earlier. So thank you, Lord Jesus. And it's, see, just, it's just hard for us to understand, right? Um, and, and, and again, if someone is listening to this, right, and really none of this makes sense to you or this whole idea about a spiritual rebirth and none of it makes sense, that's because the veil is still there. But in Christ, that's taken away and the stuff starts to make sense because Jesus comes to live in you and now gives you understanding and revelation and the ability to actually understand these things, right? Thank you, Lord Jesus. All right. Verse 13, no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the son of man. Very profound statement, right? Um, he's speaking about here that that he himself, right, and what he's telling you are, is, is direct revelation from heaven. And, you know, it's only Jesus. He says that he came from heaven. Um, and he's talking about now in a divine sense, right? Obviously, when we receive Christ with Jesus in heaven, we'll go there to be with him. But when he says no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who has came from heaven, right? Heaven, at the point of Jesus, only God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, you know, obviously have all knowledge and understanding of what heaven is, the secrets of heaven are, the insights of heaven, right? Um, and Jesus is speaking about himself, obviously, here as God, God the Son, um, who makes it clear that he came out of heaven in this verse, right? Verse 14. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, right? I believe this is from what? Numbers 21, I think. I think this is Numbers 21. I think it's verses like 7 and 6 and 7 it could be maybe. I'm going to check this out here. Um, numbers 21. Um... Yeah, it says in verse, it see, you know, it says that the people had sinned. Um, um, in verse eight, it says the Lord said to Moses, "Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live." Verse nine. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then, when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. So yes, that's. Uh, Numbers 21, verses 8 and 9. This really is a profound statement because Jesus is saying that what you read in Numbers, Nicodemus, what was stated back in Numbers, um, that reality of whatever that was a 1,200 years ago, 
where Moses spoke in numbers, that was speaking about me. Jesus says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert. So again, we know, we see again, Jesus using the scriptures, Jesus pointing the scriptures. And he's showing Nicodemus here that, that this scripture is about him, right? That it worked here, right? Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert. So when the people were bitten by snakes and they were venomous and they were going to die, um, Moses, the Lord tells Moses to make a snake. So Moses makes a bronze snake and puts it on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake, a venomous snake, and they were going to die, all they had to do was look at the bronze snake and they would, they would live. They would be healed of the venom. Now look at that, because this is a profound picture of what Christ did for us, right? It seemed like a silly thing. Right. Why would the Lord do this like this? Right. Why wouldn't he, you know, have some magnificent thing or, or medicine or, 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 or whatever or, or give some 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 profound prayer for the people to be healed? None of that. Right. The people, it says. Were, were bitten by venomous snakes. OK. They said that we have sinned in verse six when we spoke against the Lord. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Verse 8, the Lord said to Moses, make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who was bitten can look at it and live. You and I and all humanity have the venom of sin in us. Sin has bitten every human being and we have that venom in us. And because of that venom, we, we are dead spiritually, and we will ultimately die physically because we have been bitten by the venom of sin. And in the same way, right, there's nothing we can do about that. There's no work we can do. There's nothing we can do to take that venom of sin away from us, just like these people could do nothing. No way to get that venom out of them. They were going to die. But the Lord told Moses... Make a snake, put it on a pole, and anyone who seemingly looks at it, just not seemingly, anyone who looks at it will be given life, will live. And it's the same with us today. Just as Moses, verse 14, lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man was, must be lifted up. The snake was put on a pole. Jesus was nailed to a pole that we call the cross, right? Verse 15, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. It's pretty profound, right? So just like the people in Numbers 21 were healed of the venom and all they did was look upon the snake for you and I to be healed of the venom of our sin today in our death, our spiritual death, we need only look on Jesus and believe in Jesus and trust in Jesus as the payment for our sin, right? When Jesus speaks this, he's saying that back in Numbers 21, that Numbers 21 was written as a prophecy of what I would do. Just as Moses was lifted up, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Jesus was lifted up and nailed to the cross. And just as everyone who looked on that snake Numbers 21, verse 9. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. Then when anyone who was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. And for you and I who have been bitten, every human being has ever lived by the, by the venom of sin. And because of that, we are dead spiritually. If we will look unto Jesus on that cross who gave his life for us, knowing that he died for us, that it was us that nailed the, the, the nails to his hands and we nailed the hands to his feet. But if we will look unto him and believe on him and trust in him and, and, and desire and ask him to be the Lord of our life and save us from our sin, we too will be saved from the venom of that sin and we too will be granted life, spiritual life, right? It says that they lived 
and you will live. You will live spiritually. You will become a spiritually alive man or woman in Jesus Christ. And Jesus will come and live in you. So the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Just like the people who were bitten by the snakes, there would be nothing they could do except look under the snake to be healed. There's nothing you and I can do to get that sin out of us. None of the good things we do will take it away. We are hopeless and helpless. And it's only looking unto Jesus, believing in Jesus as our Savior, and calling on him and asking him to come into our heart and be the Lord of our life, that we too will be saved from our sin, from the venom of sin and spiritual death. And we too will be granted life, eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord, spiritual life. Remember when it says that we will have eternal life, it just doesn't mean a quantity of life. We certainly will live forever, right? But it also means a quality of life. Eternal life is something that begins immediately when you receive Jesus as your Savior. Mm. Well, Father, we do thank you for the living word of God. We thank you for these scriptures. We thank you for your word, Father. We just thank you, Lord, for, uh, we just thank you for Jesus. Father, we just thank you for giving us Jesus. Lord Jesus, we thank you for, for your words that we have here spoken in Nicodemus. Lord, I confess that, that, that I am often like Nicodemus saying, how can this be? I just don't understand the situation. Why would this happen? And Father, I ask you to help us to spend, to spend more time knowing you and hearing your voice and waiting on you, Lord, and just being in your presence, Lord, and studying your word, Lord, and worshiping you and thanking you and praising you and loving you and repenting where we fall short, Lord that we might understand you, Jesus. That we might understand your word, Lord. Lord, help us to accept your testimony and everything you've said, Lord. Help us to, under to understand the earthly things we have. Help us to understand the scriptures, Lord, and all that you've given us that we do have tangibly to help us to know you, that we might know it and better understand heavenly things, Lord. Jesus, we worship you and we thank you and we praise you. Holy Spirit, we ask you to lead us and guide us now and go ahead of us this day. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.